Today we have the immense pleasure uh, to talk with Gary Snyder, the American poet, uh, the laureate of the Pulitzer Prize and an eco-activist. Now, first question is, um, well, many American poets admit that they uh, read uh, European poetry in search of poetical spiritual inspiration alternative ethical order. Um, Edward Hirsch admits that uh, he uh, reads uh, Czesław Miłosz, that mm -hmm. Miłosz is uh, one of his greatest influences. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to ask you, <coughs> what is your attitude towards the, uh, towards the European poetry, the modern one, uh, while, uh, while seeking uh, measure uh, in Uh, ben Jonson's poetry, as you admitted, uh, as you admit, and Ben Jonson's poetry, mm. uh, as you as you uh, said in one of your interviews. Uh -huh. Do you consider uh, Ben Jonson European? Yes, of course. You do. Okay, I was just wondering. Is England part of Europe? <laughs> they probably may not think so, but they are. <laughs> I've always wondered. I've always wondered about that. Uh, my Influ my knowledge and also the influences I have taken from European modern poetry are slight. Uh, I became, uh, I followed European poetry up as far as Rimbaud and uh, the Spanish poet Federico Garcia Lorca, uh, but I am not up at all on German poetry uh, or Scandinavian or even Italian. Uh, because I turned my attention toward learning East Asian languages and becoming acquainted with East Asian poetics, uh, and also uh, more uh, from Mexico and South America. Uh, so Europe is uh, kind of a new country for me. The first time I visited Europe, after having lived in Japan for 12 years, uh, I had the amazing thought as I, I landed in uh, Sweden, gee, these people all look like us. I realized that uh, we had some connections. Uh, this is a hard thing for, I'm, perhaps for you guys to hear, but I belong to the West Coast, not the East Coast, and the West Coast looks across the Pacific. Uh, Europe is farther from me than China and Japan are. Uh, I am a Pacific person uh, and only a, a traveler uh, and a tourist when it comes to Europe. So I'm here as a tourist. I don't necessarily feel that it is my lineage. I see. Now, um, Mr. Snyder, um, your poetry is essentially infused with um, natural spirituality and ecological sensitivity. And you're not only a poet, but also um, a great environmental activist. And I, w I would like to ask about that. Um, some ecological activists um, believe that only the complete abandonment of technology and uh, the total retreat to nature um, will be uh, the, the cure, the most efficient cure for the Western civilization. And on the other hand, um, there are statements that it is only the newest Uh, technological advances um, that might actually save the natural environment. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, um, developments in transportation or, um, or urban, urban um, yeah. development. Mm -hmm. And um, what are your thoughts on that? And um, what is your position um, in, in relation to, to those two views? Well, those two views are both Uh, completely unreal, mm -hmm. and they don't exist in any practical realm of politics or uh, economic practice. Uh, neither one is possible. The first mm -hmm. one might happen, but it would only happen as a matter of, as a response, as a result of catastrophe. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I think that you're too optimistic to think such a catastrophe will happen. Uh, <laughs> Probably. It uh, uh, is unlikely. Mm -hmm. uh, the ecological and economic uh, answers are spread in between those two extremes. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a recent book by a, um, gosh, he's from India, a gentleman from India, uh, an academic economist from India who has been living and teaching in Germany. Uh, and uh, I forget the title of the book, but it was published uh, in uh, San Francisco. It's called Eco-Socialism or Eco-Capitalism. Now, somewhere between those two, uh, we may find uh, a way to continue uh, the existing uh, economic and social world, practically speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the key, the key question is the question of energy. None of this is possible without one or another form of energy, fossil fuel, oil, or nuclear power. We have no other choices with the present world population. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking of uh, catastrophe and n nuclear power, um, what do you think is the poet's role in, in, in dodging that or in r raising people's awareness? I don't know if there is any poet's role in mm -hmm. that. Uh, you know, poet, the, one, the first thing about a poet's role is no bullshit. Uh, and so uh, if they can't tell the truth and if they don't know what's actually scientifically and practically uh, speaking possible, there's no point in talking about it. Uh, I have a poem uh, that I wrote a few years ago that was included, in, and it's been translated into Japanese. It was included in a recent anthology of anti-nuclear poetry in Japan, uh, which is, has about 700 pages of anti-nuclear poetry, most of which is bullshit, you know, by Japanese poets. You know, God bless them. You know, they're doing the best they can, but they haven't gotten it straight yet as to what's possible and what's not possible. Uh, you talk to the atomic scientists about Fukushima, mm -hmm. and several of them have said, maybe, looking at this case, maybe nuclear power is not possible. But the public will not accept that, nor will the industry accept that for a long time. They will keep trying to do what they do. Japan only has two choices as, a, as an economy and as a country, to, be, to go back to being a self-sustaining agrarian, small agrarian country with one quarter of the population of today or to continue with nuclear power. We, we will see what happens. Neither one of them is a good choice. Uh, the same is true of the same uh, uh, difficult and almost impossible choice is sitting there for the rest of the world. Uh, the other choice is to go back to the 17th century, which is not a bad choice. Uh, when the world's population was 10% of what it is now, about 1700, in, at which time you can do a lot of things. You can travel around the world by sail. Uh, you can go to Italy and back on foot or by horse. Uh, and you can grow all the vegetables you like. <laughs> uh, I don't know where it all, where it all goes. Uh, solar energy uh, would, solar energy and wind energy would power the world as of 1700. You could all have electricity in, in 1700 if you had 10% of the present population. So it's, uh, that, that's summing it up very briefly. Now, the other part of your question is, well, what can poets do? Uh, poets can in, in pre, improve, I think, for one thing, people's sense of care for each other and people's sense of care for other living beings and for the planet as a whole. Uh, to be uh, generous, compassionate, and open to all living beings, not just to human beings. Although, you know, we have a hard enough time treating human beings well. You know, so to say, okay, now be nice to animals, it sounds like a weird thing to say. But maybe that's where we have to start. <laughs> Yeah, what you said towards the end of your answer actually is parallel to what uh, many critics uh, expect nowadays of, of poetry, the so-called eco-critics. And 
many people would perhaps uh, like to think of you as as an eco activist of a kind, uh, but still uh, your poetry remains largely uh, epiphanic, sensual, yeah. ep ep epiphanic, sensual, um, sensational, and you mean sensations? Yeah, yeah. And That's what poetry is supposed to be. So poetry is not theory. Poetry is not politics. Poetry is not economics. So I write prose, you know. I've written as many books of prose as I have of poetry. You're only asking me about my, my poetry world and my poetry work. I have another life, which is in prose. And that is where my ecological activism is. You know about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so do you, do you um, think that there is any uh, literary vocation in the largest sense of the word, literary, not poetical, or um, one that may be assumed by so-called prose writers? Uh, Maybe, I don't know. The publishing business is falling apart. Books are not selling. Bookstores are closing. Everybody is saying the internet is the new thing. What do you think? I mean, it's your generation. What do you think is going to happen? I think people still need literature for some reasons. You, by, by literature, you mean books, or do you mean writing? Writing. Is it okay for writing to be online? Honestly, I, I do think so. Do you think um, writers should be paid? Um, well, that's a difficult issue. Well, you can't be a writer if you can't make a living. Yeah, that's true. Um, Unless you want to be an academic, but that's not a real writer. But would you would you f say it's just to uh, write for a living to earn money? You, whatever you do, you have to earn enough money to feed your family. Okay. <laughs> so you're a pragmatist. <laughs> of course, I'm a pragmatist. I'm a grown-up. You know, I'm an adult. I know that I have to feed a family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. um, I would like to uh, go to the past for a second okay. and um, talk about the Beat Generation. Sure. Um, the Beat Generation with uh, whom you've been often um, associated um, did have an impact on the Polish youth during the communist era, although their works were very hard to come by, understandably. Um, the Polish youth um, identified with um, the, their subversive and countercultural and liberationist uh -huh. and anti-censorship potential very much. Um, now, I, I do appreciate that, uh, well, um, some might argue that labeling you as a, a member of the beat generation is an overstatement. Um, nevertheless, uh, Lawrence Ferlingeri did call you um, the Thora of the beat generation. And the Thoreau was not a beat generation <laughs> writer. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, however, um, here in Poland, uh, I think we would be very interested in um, hearing your uh, feelings towards being associated with, with that movement. And um, looking back at the past, where do you think your paths uh, diverged and w when did they, where did they meet? And You, know, um, you mean diverged from the beat guys? Yes, precisely. Yeah. And, um, I'm especially interested in uh, today's perspective. Uh, so, um, as of today, is there mm. perhaps any sense of affiliation or, or inspiration that continues to endure? Things change. Mm -hmm. There are uh, significant uh, efforts uh, going on in American writing, both poetry and prose, onward today at this very moment, that owe some little thing to the Beat Generation but nobody talks about it anymore. They're not thinking about it anymore. We have to move forward. We have to keep going. Things have changed. It's interesting to see how Europe 
and especially Eastern Europe, remembers the Beat Generation. We've yes. forgotten it. We are very sentimental about them. <laughs> <laughs> especially the Russians. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, I've met both Yevtushenko and uh, who's the other guy? Um, uh, the other major Russian poet of that generation, Andrei Vosensky. I met them both and they said, oh, we loved the Beat Generation. Well, what did it do for you? Oh, it told us that we could be subversive. Oh, that's nice. Uh, but what we were doing uh, uh, in San Francisco uh, in 1952, three, four, uh, we were dismantling and opposing uh, any left-wing thought that was pro-Soviet or pro-Stalinist or even pro-Trotskyite. Mm -hmm. uh, and we thought of ourselves as developing another traveling on another path of subversiveness which did not belong to the issues that Europe has. Uh, and so we looked at Kropotkinite anarchism, nonviolent, uh, do you know uh, Kropotkin's work? Peter Kropotkin? Yeah, he still is a, a relevant figure for a lot of people out on the West Coast as ter in terms of uh, uh, a genuine uh, possible anarchist philosophy combined with anthropology mm -hmm. and the study of prehistory and the study of actual living cultures that live sustainably partly in the high, in the high north, partly in the rainforest, uh, as models, uh, not models, but lessons for what is possible. Uh, so that's our kind of subversiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where Thoreau might be possibly mentioned. Okay. Uh, Thoreau <coughs> was actually influenced by Swedenborg. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so there's another, a slightly different and more complicated intellectual history there than you might think now. But I can say this, you know, in 1955, the intellectuals on the East Coast were still struggling about whether or not they should give up on Stalinism. The poets and intellectuals of the West Coast had given up on Stalinism even before the Trotsky trials uh, and were uh, and, and had a history with the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World. Do you know left-wing history? You better because that's what we're, yeah. we're still using left-wing history but it's uh, pre and post Soviet mm -hmm. intellectual history, uh, left, intellectual left history uh, that is not particularly known in some parts of the world. Mm -hmm. I know poets who will not talk about Pablo Neruda. You know why? Why? He was a Stalinist till he died. Period. Period. And there are, mm -hmm. and there are still uh, philosophers who wouldn't like to talk about Martin Heidegger or uh, some other poets who would like I don't like know to. any of those philosophers. Yeah. Not in the United States. Mm -hmm. Heidegger's Nazi connections have basically sunk him. You know, he's underwater mm -hmm. as far as, as American intellectual, serious American intellectuals are. Okay. Yeah. How is he in Germany, I wonder? I wonder how they think about him in France. Well, that's a that's a theme that's a that's a topic for a great conversation and we don't have enough time, yeah. unfortunately. You don't have time for it, but you should have mental time for it. Uh, because it, uh, you know, if you're going to be Europeans, mm -hmm. you're going to have to be total Europeans, mm -hmm. which means you've got to think about France, Germany, and Spain, and Italy, too. And England. You know, I've, and had, um, I've had five books out in the Czech Republic now for over 12 years. Mm -hmm. I've had my first book out in Poland this year. That's one funny difference between uh, the Czech Republic and Poland. Mm -hmm. And uh, that leads to my next question, uh, your book that uh, has been published uh, owing to the uh, translating and publishing efforts of the uh, Znak Publishing House. Uh, so today your poetry may reach a wide audience here in Poland and you have, uh, you are yourself a renowned translator of Oriental poetry and um, we were wondering um, how great a challenge uh, does it pose to um, accommodate um, the reflections of such a different cultural order into English? Well, okay, I'll tell you. First, I want to say I'm very grateful to Jerzy Ilg, 
uh, into uh, the, the Miwash Festival for mm -hmm. uh, undertaking to get the funding uh, to publish these books, which includes my book. And it's a very nice job they did. Not knowing any Polish, I have the faintest idea how good the translations are. They are very good. Well, good. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. You're the first person that said that to me. Really? <laughs> but I'm, you were the first person I asked that. Um, so I'm really grateful for that, and I'm grateful to have the book out. Uh, and as you say, I have not translated from uh, any of the European languages, mm -hmm. but I put myself to the task of learning a classical literary Chinese back in 1952-53, and also modern contemporary Japanese. I started studying that at the same year, 52-53. And then, uh, and that was at the University of California at Berkeley in the Department of Oriental Languages. Uh, after three years of that, 1956, I traveled to Japan. And I lived in Japan for 12 Focus. years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I became quite fluent in colloquial, modern, everyday street Japanese in more than one dialect, uh, which I was very pleased with. And uh, for a, um, uh, ever since uh, 1964, 1965, I've been married to a Japanese woman. Uh, although, uh, my Japanese is better than hers. But <laughs> she's dead now, actually. She died several years ago. It's extremely difficult to translate languages that have no cognates whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Spanish, French, and German are full of cognates to English. You can recognize half of the words once you learn how to do it. Polish, I, I could probably find cognates in Polish once I mastered how to read the orthography. You have such a difficult orthography from the standpoint of people who use the uh, English style spelling. A lot of consonants. Well, you know, that's, <laughs> and all, all, that's all, <laughs> a lot of silent consonants. Right. So, you know, all of that is just a matter of, as a linguist, I s studied Native American languages. I know how to write phonetics. Mm -hmm. You could write phonetically too. And we could write English phonetically. I taught my Japanese students how to write English phonetically. Uh, so, you know, people are very lazy about language. Uh, Americans don't know the history of the English language. Uh, I talk to a lot of Polish people who don't know the history of what branch of the Slavic languages Polish belongs to uh, or why, you know. Uh, and the historical question of why uh, some parts of Eastern Europe have a Cyrillic alphabet and some have a Roman alphabet. This is all, you know, I'm curious about these things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I'm looking forward to a time when there is more literacy, both in terms of culture and in terms of nature. People should know the history of alphabets and languages. They should also know the names of the wild flowers and the wild birds. That would be making some steps in the right direction. <laughs> Do you think that modern language is brutalized by uh, the advertisements, by the commercials, and so on? It doesn't help. It doesn't help. I, I don't know if brutalized is the right term. Uh, but uh, the daily vernacular speech of teenagers, that's what you want to listen to. The way teenagers speak, you know, teenage kids, the way teenagers speak is the way the adult generation will speak 20 years from now. I sure hope not. <laughs> well, we all hope not, but it always happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> generation after generation. Uh, and in that sense, I'm not, too, um, I'm not too pessimistic about language, actually, because language has a, vi a viability and an energy that I trust will survive the internet, radio, television, and advertising and continue into the future doing things its own way as it always has done. Uh, and people, you know, when they say to me, uh, is uh, literature over? Uh, is poetry dead now? I say, no, it'll be around. Uh, you, you know, one of the nice things about poetry is you don't need a writing system. You don't need literacy. For 10, 15,000 years, human beings had epic poems, recitations, and songs without writing. We don't even need writing. But this is radical. What I'm saying is now really radical and really subversive. And that's what I am, really subversive. <laughs>
Thank you for your answers. Uh, it was a great pleasure to thank meet you. you here. Thank you for the wonderful talk. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you for your good questions that I could answer that way. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.